Well, what I'd like to talk to you about today is a symbol that is fairly ill-defined. I mean, it's not like little e for the electron charge, but it's a big capital N. And I, I think we use capital N. N refers to number, and the capital refers to a big number. So I'd like to talk about some really big numbers. Now, it's interesting. We've all got very familiar with big numbers uh, as a result of uh, the collapse of the banking systems and the, the incompetence of governments and so on. So, for example, finance ministers now talk about borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of pounds. So we're all familiar with, even with the idea of a trillion pounds. And a trillion, of course, is, uh, let me write it down, a trillion is one with 12 zeros after it. Oh, I have to go to another line. So that's a trillion. So for convenience, rather than writing out all these noughts, we say that this uh, trillion with its 1 and 12 noughts, we write that as 10 to the power 12. And that's a pretty impressive number. Now, interestingly, uh, this is only a little bit larger than the number of stars in our galaxy. So when these uh, politicians uh, are talking about borrowing some sums, they are literally talking about astronomically large numbers. And what I'd like to talk about today are numbers which are even larger than that. Perhaps the, the, the first one to discuss is big N with a little subscript. And this subscript commemorates uh, an Italian physicist and chemist called uh, Lorenzo Avogadro. Now, Avogadro's number tells us how many atoms or molecule, molecules that we have in, in, a, in a small lump of material. And uh, the, the, the lump of material we measure in terms of grams. We don't use old British imperial or American units of, of, of ounces and pounds. We use gram. So we define the idea of a gram molecule, and a gram molecule is just, uh, for, let me give you an example for the case of carbon. Carbon has got uh, an atomic weight of 12. That means that it's got six protons and six neutrons, and protons and neutrons have both got, have got about the same mass. And we say the atomic weight of carbon is 12. So then we say that one gram molecule of carbon weighs 12 grams. And then if we use that idea of a gram molecule, then one gram molecule of carbon contains Avogadro's number worth of carbon atoms. And that number, very roughly, it's 6.02, if I remember correctly, but perhaps I'll just write it as 6. That's then given by 6 times 10 to the 23. So there's that way we write it in terms of power. But if I want to write that out in longhand, I've now got to put down 6 and 23 noughts. So I've got to put down 6. And now I can stop. So I think now I've got 6 and 23 zeros. So that's how many atoms of carbon there are in 12 grams of charcoal. My favourite number of all is this number, which is at 10 to the power of 40. Now, do you really want me to write out the 40 zeros for this one? I will if you like. Go on. Let's right, go. all right then. I'm nearly there, aren't I? 36, 39, 40. Yeah, done it. So there's the number. It's a really big number. Now, that number is, has got the symbol of just big N. Uh, I think it's a fascinating number. Uh, Dirac, uh, one of the great heroes of quantum mechanics, uh, was also uh, interested in these large numbers, and he came up with his so-called large number hypothesis, which I'd like to tell you about. Uh, that there are two important things in physics that, 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 uh, that have this have this correspond to this very, very large number. And one of them is the strength of the electrical force. So I can write that the electrical force, Fe, over the force of gravity corresponds to this. So let's imagine now that we've got a negatively charged electron and a positively charged proton. Uh, the electron has mass and the proton has mass. And so because these two particles have mass, they're attracted to each other. But because they've got opposite charges, they're also attracted to each other by uh, the force, by electrical forces, by Coulomb's law. And in fact, this ratio is about 10 to the 40. So the electrical force is that much stronger than the gravitational force. Uh, this ratio is comparable with roughly the age of the universe and the time it takes uh, a photon traveling at the speed of light to, to cross 
uh, the diameter of, a, of, of this proton. Now it's perfectly re re reasonable for me to put a magnifying, magnifying glass on this proton. It has got a radius, it's very, very small, and it's given by 10 to the minus 15 meters. So that's the radius of a proton. Now that's small, and of course, uh, the light travels at a tremendously fast speed of three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So a photon can shoot across this diameter in a very short interval of time. Then we can relate that very short time to the longest time that we know about, which is of course the longest time we can conceive of is the age of the universe. And we know that the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years, which is 13.7 thousand million years. So that's a very long time, and this is an incredibly short time. Uh, the age of the universe is about 10 to the 17 seconds. And then if we divide that by the time it takes the photon to cross, the new, to cross a proton, and lo and behold, 10 to the 17 divided by this very small number gives me 10 to the 40. So we've got the ratio of these two times uh, being approximately equal. And it led, it, it led Dirac to the uh, very, very interesting, but as it turned out, wrong idea that these numbers were fundamentally uh, related to each other. Th this, 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 this strange coincidence was, 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 was finally sorted out. And I, so I'd like to, like to tell you how the paradox was sorted out by uh, a very clever guy from Princeton, a guy called uh, Robert Dickey. And this coincidence really isn't a coincidence at all for the following reason. What Dickey noted was that the laws of physics, the electrical forces and the gravitational forces, are important in determining the lifetime of stars. So if it happened that the gravitational force was much, much stronger, then stars would be more compact objects, they would burn their nuclear fuel more quickly, and stars wouldn't live so long. We, we are here observing the universe at its present age, and Therefore, this is a, a rather special situation in because you know, we're around to observe the present age of the universe. But for us to be around to observe the age of the universe, certain requirements must be met. And amongst those requirements uh, are that, that we're made of things not just of hydrogen, but of things like phosphorus and, uh, and carbon, most importantly. So what Dickey realized was that in order for us to be around to notice this interesting coincidence, there must have been several life cycles of stars. In other words, the universe has to be at least as old as the age of a star, and probably is the age of, of several stars. So what, what, what Dickey realized was that the fact that the, the age of the universe as we presently observe it is simply a consequence of the laws of physics as applied to stars, and therefore these two numbers are just, just a con a consequence of the anthropic principle, if you like, that we're around to observe, uh, uh, observe a universe. The universe has to be this old for observers to be around. In another 10 to the 40 zillion trillion years, if humans are still around, that coincidence won't be the case anymore, will it? No, it, it won't. It will change as the universe gets older. But, other, but, but on those very, very long time scales, I mean, other things will, will happen. I mean, the, you know, the, our sun will burn out by then. And uh, uh, so either, unless, unless we go and colonize some other other star, a planet around a star, then uh, we won't be, around to, won't be around to observe that. Now, there is an even bigger number, a couple of other bigger numbers that come from this, which, which, which also fascinates me. If you t as I mentioned already, if you take the square of this number, and this, this, this gives you the 10 to the 80, 10 to the 80 is approximately equal to the number of protons in the universe. So I'll write proton there. Uh, and uh, the number of protons in the universe is roughly that size as well. Uh, so that's another interesting large number, and I'm not going to bother to write out uh, 80 zeros, but that's, a, that's another story and a fascinating one. What do all your colleagues think about this? Do they enjoy this like the way you do? Well, I guess so, yeah. They, I go on too much of this in the tea room. They think I'm a bit crazy talking about large numbers, so I think about them as a bit of a hobby. I ought to be spending more time doing semiconductor physics.